Welcome to another anti-podcast, Science in Theology. My name is Nemanja Jurišić, and today we are here with our uh, favorite professor, uh, <laughs> Dr. Richard Hess. Dr. Rick, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. How are you doing? I'm awesome with you, so <laughs> I'm really happy, and uh, it's a real privilege to have you here with us. So uh, for those who don't know, Dr. Hess is a distinguished professor of Old Testament and Semantic Languages. And please follow his work at uh, oldtestamentquestions.com. So, Professor, uh, you told me that uh, you have a class in one hour, so we are in a rush a little. So <laughs> <laughs> we should start with our topic, United Monarchy. But before we, uh, that, please, can you briefly uh, in, uh, give an introduction about the debate between biblical maximalism and uh, minimalism? And uh, please explain. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, uh, of course, interesting area, and it's just uh, sort of come to the fore in the last 30 or 40 years with uh, a group of people who came to be known as minimalists. They they don't necessarily accept or like that term, but uh, it's a collection of professors, especially, uh, I would say, Niels Peter Lemke and Thomas Thompson at the University of Copenhagen, and then the late Philip Davies at the University of Sheffield. And there have been more who have studied with them and uh, have followed some of their ideas. But uh, the, the tenets of this view or, or, or some of the basic elements of it emerged around 1992 and three with the publication by Thomas Thompson of a book called The History of the Early Israelite Peoples. In, in which he really argued that the Bible, as the Old Testament as we know it, is really the product of a very, very late period. He would say that there isn't much there that was written before, certainly the Persian period, but he would even say after the Persian period, and that would end around 332, 331 BC with the coming of Alexander the Great into the Middle East and uh, what then is called the Hellenistic period. And so he sees a lot of the Bible being written in the uh, third century, even second century BC, which is very late. And uh, so things like Abram, that's entirely fictitious. Things like uh, the story of Moses doesn't uh, never took place. And even, even uh, perhaps in areas that we're more uh, looking at today, which is the United Monarchy, Saul, David, Solomon, these figures are, are, were in his book there back in the early 90s. That's over 30 years ago now. Uh, in his book, they were fictitious. They didn't really exist. In fact, um, he understood that area of the world, Palestine or Israel, as having been made up of uh, all kinds of different peoples who then in the 8th and 7th centuries BC, the, Neo -Assyri the Assyrian Empire came into that area and deported everyone in his view. And the Babylonians as well deported people and they resettled an entirely different group of people. So that the people who were present there during the time when we would say David, for example, ruled around 1000 BC, didn't exist. They were no longer present. They had been spread across the, the uh, ancient Near East, the Middle East, and other groups had come in. So that by the time you get to the 6th and 5th and 4th centuries BC, the, the time of the Persian Empire and uh, after that, the people there are are just a hodgepodge of different groups that have come in according to this theory they don't represent any any uh, heritage and so the bible is really a make up made up interpretation of uh, giving these people some identity that they developed and invented about the, about the, the time of the hellenistic period so it's really that that is uh, that is sort of the foundation in a lot of ways on on which this theory was built. And uh, Philip Davies, also uh, writing in English, wrote more po a bit more of a popular volume or two on in search of ancient Israel and its identity. 
and argued something similar that it was groups in the second century or third century BC who, who wrote the Old Testament. And the pro of course, the problem with this has been that uh, there are those of us who, who really see that there is much more historical evidence <laughs> connecting uh, the world, even that world of the United Monarchy of Saul, David, and Solomon with, uh, with the Bible and with its records and with what it has to say that we can't just dismiss it uh, as simply make-believe from, from centuries and centuries later. Yeah, uh, Dr. David Falk said that in the last 40 years, there are uh, more and more biblical maximalists. So, uh, yeah, good. Yeah, I think one of, the, one of the realities is that the more... Uh, archaeology that has been done, the more exploration, the more interpretation, the study of texts and of the sites, the more there is evidence, not proving every detail, but it certainly provides a background that is very compatible with much of the historical record that we have in the Old Testament from these times. Uh, and that uh, connection is really difficult to overlook, uh, whatever you do then with the, with the particular uh, accounts. All right. Uh, someone thinks that uh, biblical maximalists are fringe scholars and biblical minimalists are mainstream. So, uh -huh. uh, and also uh, ma minimalists are less biased. Do you agree with that or no? Well... Uh, no, of course, in what I've just said, it wouldn't uh, support that. And I, I really don't support that. I, I don't think that uh, everyone has a bias. Everyone has a perspective from which they approach uh, uh, something like the Bible, which is really, really, you know, very, very uh, full of assertions and claims and other things. So what are you going to do with that? And, and uh, so people come with some degree of faith or a lack of faith or whatever. But that's that's the way we are. That's how we are made. So it's better to admit that and to be aware of it and then to try to work with it than to assume, no, I'm totally objective. No one is objective. And least of all, least of well, not least of all, but certainly not at all are, are uh, people who who take a view that the Bible is entirely make-believe uh, or fairy stories, as, as uh, I've heard it called, uh, that's just simply uh, not without bias. That's, in fact, taking a bias because the Bible makes claims. It comes from an ancient time. What are you going to do with those claims? You have to, you have to make the decisions for yourself. Okay, great. Uh, let's now shift the main topic, United Monarchy. Uh, minimalists argue that this kingdom must have been different from the one presented in the biblical texts. For example, uh, 1 Kings and 2 Samuel, uh, stating that the current archaeological evidence does not indicate that a state organization of this kind once existed. What is your thought and uh, do you have some evidences for a United Monarchy? Yeah, no, this is a very good question uh, because, of course, it's it's where the focus comes in, uh, and and the question is really, uh, did anything exist at this time? What what we know is that the major sort of superpowers of the ancient world, both before and especially after this period, and the period we're talking about is roughly. 1050 BC down to 930 BC, that period of time. So as, as we look at that time, we know that earlier um, there were major empires. There was to the east in what is today modern Iraq, the Assyrian Empire uh, centered around the Tigris River. There was uh, earlier the Hittite Empire up in Turkey. And there was, and sort of always was, the Egyptian Empire in, in ancient Egypt. And after this period, uh, the Assyrians rose again, and then the Babylonians coming out of that area of Iraq. And Egypt continued to have periods of greater strength and lesser strength. It never quite 
rose back up to what it had been before before this time, before 1050 BC. But I would say that during this particular period, 1050 to 930, all of these empires were weak. They were not as strong as they would be later on. They were characterized by a time when there was a lot of internal strife, when there was uh, issues going on within the country. And so their expansion into places like Israel, Palestine, that expansion did not take place. So we have what you might call a kind of power vacuum in this area. It will gradually be taken over by the Assyrians, but at this time, it is, it is a weaker period and uh, in, in terms of these empires. And so there is an opportunity to fill in that vacuum with uh, a, a, a local kingdom. And we see this. We see this emerging in the, in the north up in, um, in what is today Syria, northern Syria and that area. There are what are called the Neo-Hittite kingdoms that arise at this time and become strong and influential. But here in and around Israel in the south or the southern Levant, as it's sometimes called, that region is ripe for the emergence of a sort of control by uh, a, a central empire. Now, do we have evidence of anything like that happening and emerging? Well, second, uh, certainly, uh, Second Samuel already with the rise of David in chapters uh, five, six, seven, eight. In these chapters, it suggests that a kingdom under David begins to occupy and sort of win battles against the surrounding powers, the Philistines to the west, the Ammonites and, and Moabites to the east and to the northeast and north, the Arameans. So all these different groups now, we don't have a lot of records from this time, just bits and pieces, but we do have some and more and more that that is emerging. But the the evidence that we do see um, is interesting archaeologically in terms of what what we know and what's available. Let me let me first of all speak in terms of a bit of the architecture uh, and the cities around uh, around that area. 1 Kings 9 recounts how during the reign of Solomon, he had major storage cities and kind of chariot cities built at Hatzor to the north of his empire. Today, that's up in northern Israel at Megiddo uh, on the western end of the Jezreel Valley. It's, it's always been an important city and center for thousands of years. And and uh, he made it a chariot city and center. And then to in, in Gezer, to, to the south, which uh, was actually, according to the Bible, a gift, a dowry given uh, with his uh, bride from Egypt uh, by the Egyptian pharaoh. But all of these are in Israel. And what's interesting is they all show a similar architectural style. They all have similar... Uh, sort of larger public buildings where there could be storage or other things, and they have similar multi-chambered gates. Their main gates are these six-chambered gates, which don't really continue much after this period, but are important at this time. And that's very unusual. If this were simply scattered across different uh uh, states and groups, each of these cities different, they would have different architecture, but they don't. The similarity of the architecture bears witness to a common uh, control and center. And uh, that's what we find here. We find that uh, this exactly conforms to 1 Kings 9, where we read about this uh, and Solomon having built these. But even before Solomon, his father in the time of David, was, according to the Bible, building J Jerusalem and uh, building some of his palaces and other things at Jerusalem. And one of the late uh, archaeologists who excavated in the late 19th, 20th century and early 21st century is a woman named Elat Mazar. And Mazar discovered what she called a very large building uh, from the 10th, early 10th century B.C., 
a building that that would be in, in Jerusalem. And the building in Jerusalem was simply too large for simply a small village or as some have said, a cow town, <laughs> just uh, a, an unimportant uh, site or even one ruled by a local sort of mayor or chieftain. It was it is one of the largest buildings from that time in the whole region. And what that witnesses to is that there was an important center here in Jerusalem. It wasn't accidental. There was something going on in this time, in the 10th century, as, as David's latter part of his reign was taking place, and he was consolidating and building his kingdom. And then during the time of Solomon, who begins around 970 BC, and then continues for 40 years and continues to build. So architecturally, we have a number of witnesses then, in terms uh, uh, from another perspective, we have the interesting inscriptional evidence. And over the past three or four decades, we have seen really an emergence of, do of really dozens of different inscriptions from the 10th century BC from this area of Is what, what would be Israel, written in an alphabetic script that in the earlier period is this sort of sometimes called Canaanite or proto-Canaanite. And then after the 10th century develops into uh, the different alphabetic scripts of Israel uh, uh, in the north, Judah in the south, and the Phoenician script and so forth. But from this time, we probably have a couple dozen scripts. One of the most important finds has been in a site in uh, that overlooks the Valley of Elah, where David and Goliath fought, according to the Bible. And then at that site, there is a fort called Kirbet Kayatha. And in Kirbet Kayatha, there are several inscriptions that have been found since the 10th century, one of which is actually on a, on a potsherd. And remember, from this early in a place like Israel, you may have had lots of writing in the form of papyrus from the papyrus plant uh, or vellum, uh, animal skins, but all of that disappears. There's nothing left of that because of that's made of organic matter and it just disintegrates over thousands of years. The only place where that is preserved is in very, very dry places like Egypt or later on the Dead Sea and the Dead Sea Scrolls. But places like Jerusalem and other places where the most writing would have been done, sadly, that's not preserved. But what is preserved was what kind of ancient note paper and uh, stationary ancient, which was pot shirts. And so they wrote on that. And sure enough, among the many, many pot shirts with writing on it that have been found from this time, numbers increasing, you have this uh, five-line inscription from Kirbet Kayafa with text that clearly is in a Semitic language and probably predates Hebrew as we know Hebrew later, but would have been from around the time of the Bible, David and Solomon. And it mentions the word for judge, uh, it mentions the word for king, melek, that we mentioned, a number of different words that we know. There's still a lot of debate about exactly how to translate it because it's it's only partial, fragmentary, and and the actual script is uh, is is not entirely clear. But what is clear is that this is a writing from this time, and it's not just the name of somebody. We have lots of writing with names on it. But it's more than that. We do have as well from a site to the west of this, again, from this same period of, of uh, day, around David's time, we have what's called an ABCD or uh, 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 an attempt to recount or to learn your ABCs in, uh, in ancient Canaanite and Hebrew. And that's from a site called Isbet Sarda, which is often associated with Ebenezer in Samuel, where uh, the Israelites were camped against the Philistines across the valley at Afek. And so clearly another, and in terms of architecture, another Israelite center. And there were people there, even in what is really just a village, uh, apparently learning to read and write. There's a, there are other abbasideries 
from other places in the area as well that have been found, as well as inscriptions. And then one of the most interesting ones isn't Hebrew at all, now it seems. It was found in Jerusalem by Mazar back uh, about 10 years ago now, and it was thought to, uh, to, to be one of these proto-Canaanite, proto-Hebrew early inscriptions with just six or seven characters on it uh, in, in an alphabetic script. But nobody could really satisfactorily translate it. Then this past year, a scholar who works in these sorts of things in Jerusalem, Weinstub, found and identified it not even as Canaanite, but as what he would call Old South Arabic, uh, a short inscription, which he translated, and it's broken and only partial, but he translated the word ladanum. Ladanum is a spice, a spice from South Arabia, where Yemen is today, and the Horn of Africa across. And we know from the Bible that this is where the Queen of Sheba which is modern day Saba, which is the capital and connected with a city in Yemen, uh, came. And she came from there to learn about Solomon and about his wisdom and his fame had reached that far. And she would have brought with her uh, material to trade and exchange and so forth there between her uh, uh, country in uh, Yemen and Jerusalem. And now for the first time, we actually have a text written in that language that comes from Jerusalem from the same period, the 10th century BC, and is, is now increasingly being recognized as written in that old South Arabic script. So what are you gonna do? The, the more you kind of sit back and wait and read and see, the more discoveries, both in terms of the writing and in terms of the architecture, yield more and more evidence right from Israel. Now, I haven't even begun to touch on the temple and the evidence of the temple. By the way, that ladanum is probably to be connected with one of the spices that's mentioned in Exodus 29 as one of the spices that is to be used in the temple to be kept burning day and night, the fires there and the spices, which were, of course, designed to create a sweet aroma to honor and worship God, and frankly, would serve to help cover up the, the odors of what was a place of slaughter for, for animals and sacrifice. And so you would want something like this, and that's exactly what it was. But anyway, I was going to also just mention, if I might, um, the uh, evidence from First Kings four, five, six, seven, uh, that description of the organization of Solomon's uh, kingdom and of the temple. And uh, maybe I should talk about the temple first in chapters five, six, and seven. Uh, what we know is the temple is described in great detail there. There is a description of a three-part temple. You have the outer court, you have the holy place, and then you have the most holy place. It's modeled a bit on the tabernacle, but in many of the details, it resembles uh, the temples of this period, the 10th century BC, the temples of other gods and goddesses. And I think what Solomon was doing, let me say this, is not that he was worshiping other gods there, although he did wind up, of course, worshiping other gods and goddesses with with his marriage to uh, women from all different uh, beliefs and nations round about. But I think when he built the temple in Jerusalem, he was building the biggest temple ever to the biggest God. And what he was saying is, this is, this is the center. This is the center uh, economically and politically, but it's also the center religiously. And if you want to worship the greatest God, then you should look here. And so he modeled it on the Canaanite temples, uh, some of them round about. Um, it's long been noted that this three-part uh, temple exists. And we now uh, know as a result of a temple to a weather god 
uh, from the 10th century BC, north of the Syrian city, the modern day city, city of Aleppo. And I've gone up there if you uh, years ago, I went, you take about a 30 minute uh, trip uh, north and west of Aleppo, and you come to a site called Aindara. And Aindara, at Aindara, there's an ancient temple that uh, was there. It's, uh, it's three parts. Many of the outer designs and things can be related to some of what's going on with the designs in the uh, in of Solomon's temple. And most interestingly, this is the first temple that's ever been found that has around it side buildings, three the three part, of course, the entrance is is open, but then uh, around the other three sides, you have, uh, what what are probably storage rooms. People would bring gifts and things like that to the temple, and they would store them there. And there's evidence that these storage rooms were more than one story. They were two or three stories high uh, around the sides of the temple. It sort of protected the temple, but it also was a great place to keep the valuables stored very close by where the temple itself was. And uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful sight to see. You could go and visit and walk around. Sadly, because of the war that has taken place there, a plane strafed this, and uh, it's now today just rubble. But we do have photographs and pictures without question. Uh, you, you could, uh, some of us actually saw it. And it is uh, identical to the description of what we have, the Temple of Solomon, in terms of these side chambers. It's amazing because nothing like that was ever found. And again, more closely, a temple in what is today southern Turkey, the little blip that goes down uh, in the Hatay Plain, right around what uh, would be the site near the site of ancient Antioch, uh, where the disciples were first called Christians in the New Testament. Well, about 10 miles east of that is a site called Tayanat. And Tayanat was the great center of that region in the 10th century, 9th century, 8th century BC. And right there, there has been uh, the exploration and discovery of a temple. Again, three parts, similar description to what we have with the Temple of Solomon. And most interesting here, they found a treaty or covenant in the Holy of Holies. Just like in Deuteronomy 30 and 31, you also have this description. That's where you should keep the treaty that God has made with you, the covenant, the covenant of Deuteronomy. And it's the first time one has actually been found in the whole, most holy place. So we have lots, we have a number of descriptions and real temples like this outside of Israel proper. But they bear witness to this time and this place and this description. You have nothing like that 300 years later, 400, 500, 600 years later. No one knew to describe something like this so close in time and place. Uh, you also, and I, I mentioned 1 Kings 4, which is the uh, administrative description of the governors that Solomon appointed all over his kingdom to kind of make sure that the supplies came and everything was done. And he has a list. And at the end, he has an extra governor mentioned connected with Judah. Uh, doesn't have the name. It's kind of odd that way. And people have jumped on this and said, well, whatever this was, it's been distorted. It's been changed. It's been altered. And at best, this is a list that someone found lying around and kind of put it together hundreds of years later. But now we know as a result of a lot of administrative information from tablets, cuneiform tablets from the 12th century, 13th century BC, 14th, at, at places like Alalak up north near to uh, where I mentioned Antioch and Tayanawa, and at Ugarit on the coast of Syria, uh, the Mediterranean coast of Syria, hundreds of administrative tablets have been found. And I've gone through these and I can show you every single one of the, what are called changes or alterations. No, they aren't. That's the way they wrote these texts. That's exactly how they wrote them. And even that extra little guy put at the end, 
I, I can show you a text from Ugarit that does exactly that. It gives a list of administrative leaders, and then it has a separate one at the end that's different and written, written in an odd manner. Uh, I don't know why that's a style that they used, but it matches that of uh, what we have in First Kings four. You don't have it later. We have no. We don't have anything like that in the ninth, eighth, seventh, sixth centuries BC. So these are a number of different things, a number of different examples that I can present of some of the uh, architecture, the writing and texts, and uh, some of the descriptions of buildings and administration that we find here. Uh, really, really interesting uh, connections as you begin to explore and see what's going on. And even those who may not accept uh, the Bible word for word or whatever will, if they are serious in terms of their archaeological studies and their textual studies, will say there, there's something going on in these descriptions. Uh, particularly as the kingdom emerges under David and then under Solomon into what it describes as a really full-blown kingdom empire. There's something going on in terms of these descriptions that just matches too closely the 10th century and doesn't really allow us to simply ignore the parallels. Too, too much is here to be coincidence. <laughs> Wow, this is exciting. So uh, many uh, informations and evidences. Uh, I believe that uh, many of those are uh, new, uh, recent. Um, I saw uh, recently Dr. Daniel Weinstab and uh, his work about uh, Queen Sheba or Saba. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That uh, uh, text I mentioned, the That's Old South you... Arabic. Yeah, well, part of that is Old South Arabic itself. It's only in the last... 30 years or so that they found thou I'm talking about thousands of short texts written on wooden pieces in this very dry climate there there in the desert of southern well, the southern Arabian Peninsula and other things they just found and it used to be thought that well there's nothing in old South Arabic before the 7th century BC or 8th century BC Queen of Sheba that's all a bunch of hooey you know make believe but now uh, we have texts extending that far back into the 10th century. And uh, again, as I say, unbelievable thousands of these uh, this inscriptional material. I'll, much of it hasn't been published. It's just there. And of course, what I'm describing to you is actually up in Jerusalem. But now we actually have texts like that. <laughs> okay, what happened? <laughs> Yeah, uh, nice. So, yeah, I uh, saw uh, Dr. Daniel's uh, work. Uh, it's about 20 pages, but uh, I saw a massive references, about five, six pages. So incredible. Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah. Now, uh, can you please uh, one by one go uh, both uh, internal and uh, archaeological evidences about uh, persons like Saul, David, Solomon and Rehoboam. Can you uh, one by one go? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, um, Saul, of course, is unique and interesting character as the, the first one who is really a, a kingly figure, a royal figure, uh, bringing together the different tribes. And so when he starts out, what we have are the period of the judges before this. You have figures like Samuel being described. And you really have more of a sort of independent states or, or tribal groups. But they want to come together. They want a king. If you read, you read the story of 1 Samuel 8 and how the people demand a king. And, so, and Samuel is uh, in some ways hurt by this. He says they have rejected me as their leader, as the sort of priestly figure who is who is leading. And God says to Samuel, no, they've really rejected me because I was the one who was uh, just to be the king for them. So he says, well, go ahead and appoint them a king. And so Saul, who is a tall figure, handsome, uh, stands out among the people, he becomes the first figure appointed. His name, Shaul, means ask for or request. Uh, and of course, it's, it's very fitting because it is the people who have requested him. And so it may be that that a name was even 
uh, created or given to him as time went on. But the interesting thing about it is that he is very closely connected with Benjamin. And Benjamin is, of course, one of the early tribes there in the central hill country. I, I, uh, if, if, if you look at where Israel is really focused at the time Saul becomes leader, they're focused in what were a lot of villages that sprung up like three or four hundred villages by the count that have been discovered around 1200 BC, which is just when I would see the Israelites settling in the land. And then um, during the period of the judges, some of them continue, some of them are abandoned, but you still have this central area between the Jezreel Valley and the Sea of Galilee in the north and Jer the area around Jerusalem in the south. And, and in between that, you have three tribes that are settled. You have the tribe of Benjamin in the, uh, the southernmost, then Ephraim and Manasseh. And Ephraim and Manasseh, if you remember your uh, story of Genesis, are the traditionally the two sons of Joseph. And Joseph and Benjamin were the sons of Rachel. So these are sometimes called the, the Rachel tribes. But these are special. They were always Jacob's favorites, and they, they have a special role uh, sort of in the center uh, early on. Well, Saul comes from Benjamin. Now, uh, the name itself, while it's found in the Bible, is actually an ancient name. It is a name, it, it means uh, Ben, son, and Yamin, uh, which is the German, <laughs> Benjamin, uh, uh, Yamin means son of the right hand. And, and what that is, is if, you, in, if you're trying to get your directions in, uh, in Israel, you look towards the east. And so the right hand, your right side is south. So Benjamin would be more of the south. But, but uh, of course, that makes sense if you're just looking at those three tribes, because it's the southernmost tribe. Judah, of course, is still farther south. Uh, and that will become more important under David. But I wanted to mention that because Benjamin is actually named as a not just one tribe, but a tribal confederation several hundred years earlier in, in a group of texts that are West Semitic uh, of, uh, from the time of uh, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob around the 18th century at Mari on the Euphrates River. And there... Uh, there were two tribal groups, the Benu Simalites and the Benu Yamin, <laughs> Yaminites. And the Benu Simalites were the tribal groups to the north, to the left, to the north. And the Benu Yaminites were the tribal groups to the right, to the south. And the Benu Yaminites are Benjamin. That's where the name comes from. In fact, uh, these are known to have met and renewed their treaties and their vows at an ancient town called Haran, which is the Haran mentioned in Genesis. So you have all these interesting core connections between the ancestors of uh, and, and people connected with Jacob and Joseph and so forth, and the name Benjamin that is so importantly connected with Saul. Well, Saul comes from there. He brings together the tribal groups. He may have built for himself a bit of a center. Long ago, it was excavated uh, at the site of Gibeah, just to the north of Jerusalem. And there was something of a major structure, but just part of one excavated there. There's been a lot of discussion about that, whether that was in fact a part of a much larger palace or something that he built. Could have been, maybe not. But clearly there was architecture and building going on during the time of Saul. But it was just beginning and getting underway. Then you have David. And of course, David comes. And if you read the story from 1 Samuel, really 15, when he's anointed king, up until he becomes king uh, in 2 Samuel, and all that he does re with reference to Saul. You know the story of Saul and David and how Saul is really out to kill David because he thinks David wants to take over the kingship, and David has now been anointed by Samuel. Uh, but David always honors Saul. 
He says, I will not touch the Lord's anointed. And the word for anointed there is Mashiach. It's for the word we get Messiah from. He, he is the, because that's what it means, anointed one. And so David will not. And in the end, he becomes king anyway, despite the fact that he refuses, although he has several opportunities to even kill Saul, he refuses to do that. He honors him. And so when he becomes king, he has, he has nothing to, he has no blood guilt on his hands. There is nothing like that that is, that is on his hands. And that's one of the tremendous things about uh, that story. And um, it's just uh, it's just an example of what is going on here. And what you what you find is that this type of literature is already known. There's a Hittite story about the rise of a, a king up in Turkey a few hundred years earlier called Hattusilis the Third. And Hattusilis also writes a similar story in which he justifies his becoming king. Now, we don't know how true that is or not, but the fact is this idea of a justification, or some people call it an apology, was well known and existed at that time. So there you have the rise of David as he becomes king. And of course, the name David itself is not a name that's well known, but it seems as though it may either come from an ancient name for a governor or a leader, or more likely, it could come from a name that is connected with the word for uncle, or kind of leader of the family sometimes, that figure, or even the word do, uh, dod in, that's common in the Song of Songs and elsewhere, meaning beloved. Um, we know that uh, Solomon, his son, is named Yedidiah. And Yedidiah, Yedid, that deed means beloved. And so that may be uh, related to uh, David's name as well. We don't exactly know because there's a number of possibilities. But clearly it comes from this early period. And uh, David becomes a leader. He, he takes on to him uh, a number of figures then who follow him and become important in, uh, in the leadership role. So there you have a figure of David. He, during his time, I didn't mention this in talking about the arch architecture, but there are there is in addition to this big building that Mazar found, there is also what's called a stepstone structure, which is built right up against this the sort of what's called the hill, which is the city of David, south of the Temple Mount. And it's almost as though it adds uh, space on the top of the temple uh, of, of the city of David so he can build larger, maybe some of his larger buildings, administrative buildings and things up there. But it's called the Milo, M-I-L-L-O, and it occurs a number of times early in the Bible in these accounts of David and Solomon. Uh, so, uh, again, you have evidence of that from, from the pottery and things that suggest that, indeed, it goes back to the 10th century B.C. Solomon then comes uh, after David, and, of course, Solomon is well known uh, as a figure in the Bible. Shalomo comes from the word for peace uh, and well-being. And it seems as though this name, which is already known, there are one or two examples of the name uh, Shlomo or Shalamu, uh, which are found uh, in the centuries before this at Alalak and elsewhere. So it's not an unknown name, uh, but it's not as common of a name. Uh, and it is picked up and used then with Solomon. And of course, as we have some evidence of these names, Solomon Day and David and Saul, although we think of these names as very common, they actually aren't used again throughout the Old Testament times. They only appear much later during the times of, of the Roman period, Hellenistic memory and Roman period, when, the, uh, when they begin using some of the earlier biblical names. But these names are almost like retired and kept separate. As, uh, as separate names. Um, in reflecting on this, there's one other interesting thing. Of course, Solomon's very wealthy. We've already talked about his, his uh, exchange with the Queen of Sheba. 
um, of spice. But also at this time, uh, there's a very, very important metal. One of the most important metals is copper. And copper is alloyed with tin to make bronze, which is used for most of the weaponry and other hard metal instruments like plows and things like this that they would use. Very important for that is, is the bronze. Now, iron is gradually coming in. This is the beginning of the Iron Age. But as you read in the Bible, it says even during the time of Saul, Saul and Jonathan were the only ones with iron spears. So there just weren't that many around. And But co uh, copper and uh, bronze is very important. There's copper in the Mediterranean at Cyprus that was mined early on. But by the time of David and Solomon, that was disappearing. And you know where the copper was being mined? It was being mined south of the Dead Sea. And we now have discovery and identified some earlier copper mines farther south on the Israel side, um, about 10 or 15 miles north of uh, Eilat and the, and the Gulf of Aqaba in a site called the Timna Valley, where we have thousands of these circles, which would have been mine shafts over hundreds and ye of years they used for copper mining that developed and, and was already there early on. E Egypt occupied that area and used it. But even more important at this particular time, you have the w Wadi Fainun, which uh, is just south of the Dead Sea, about 15 miles on the Jordan side. And that has been excavated in the last 30 years or so. And what they found was a settlement in this region and lots of uh, evidence of copper mine going on right from this period, as early as this period. In fact, for a long time, people said, well, nobody lived there. There's nothing, no one in that region. But they were looking at the plateaus up above and they were looking for the Edomites, which are mentioned in the Bible and are located here. But now we know that the Edomites or the people who were connected with Edom at this time geographically were not on the plateau mainly, but they were in the valleys mining. And we have lots of we have evidence of the copper mines in, in this valley. And uh, the Fainun Valley, as it's called now, may well be Punan in the itinerary of the Israelites in Numbers 33. It's uh, spelled P-U-N-O-N -N there and uh, relates uh, linguistically to this name. So anyway, a few footnotes and other things there, but uh, just a couple of things. Um, but I, uh, I'm kind of running out of time here. What I would like to do is uh, tell you a story, <laughs> if I may. We started out with the with the maximalists and the so-called minimalists, and there's 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 one kind of discovery that I've kind of left. It's a little bit later. It's not the 10th century, the time of David and Solomon, but it's the 9th century after the um, kingdom has uh, broken up. You mentioned Rehoboam, of course. Rehoboam, Rahab is a well-known name, and the Am on the end, Rahab, means to make wide or to widen. Rahab, in fact, uh, has the same name root, so it's a, a name It's known at Tanakh, possibly, and certainly in other places uh, from an earlier period as a good Canaanite, West Semitic Hebrew name. Uh, so, so we have that uh, that name during the time of Rehoboam, but in the in the decades after that, uh, in the north, uh, the, uh, they of course at Tel Dan was one of the major cities, and one of the major discoveries at the end of the 20th century is something called the Tel Dan inscription. The Tel Dan inscription. Now that was found around 1993 or four, and Avraham Baran was the excavator of that. Uh, he was in charge of of the area of excavating Dan, and my the story is is my own because I was at a conference at that time in Germany, and it was kind of an international conference on biblical studies, and there were lots of different papers being given. And one of the smaller unit uh, place, uh, paper uh, groups was a group where a paper was being given by a man named Gabby Barkai. He is a archaeological excavator in Jerusalem and, and still lives. 
uh, but uh, a senior figure there. And he gets up, he was going to talk on, I think, Hebrew, Hebrew terms for tomb architecture. It didn't draw a large crowd. There were a couple dozen of us there. And he gets up and speaks and he begins, he introduces his paper by saying, well, I'm so sorry that there aren't more people here. I was on the phone last night. Of course, he's in Germany. Uh, I was on the phone to my friend uh, Abraham Baran uh, calling from Dan in, in Israel. And he proceeded to announce the discovery of this inscription. Now, this is an ins Aramaic inscription from around 850 or so BC. And it's very clearly written. It's fragmented. But it talks about the Aramaic king and the victories he had over the king of Israel at that time, Northern Kingdom. And it mentions the Southern Kingdom and his victories over Beit David. Uh, Beit David, it would go right to left, the house of David. Now, the house of David, that's the first mention of the name David outside the Bible before the fourth, third centuries BC, the Hellenistic period. Nothing other than in the Bible mentions David. So, just a year before, these guys that I mentioned had published a book saying there was no David. There was no evidence of David around. So anyway, Biran announces this. I get up after the uh, after the, the, the paper and I walk over to the food court of the university where it's being held. And here are these guys. And I know them and I say, hey, have you guys heard of this? And of course they hadn't because it just had been found the day before. And I proceeded to explain to them, uh, Beit David, that's how it's being understood. And it's the early mention of David from the from within 100 years of his, his lifetime or 120, 30 years of his lifetime. And it was very interesting to see the responses because one response was, well, that maybe is a forgery and you can't really trust it. Now, nobody can say that. Uh, if they say that in public, they get sued because you, know, you can't simply accuse somebody. And Avram Baran was one of the most respected archaeologists of the time. And so this was always an undercurrent. But uh, unfortunately, it was it was used by this one scholar who, uh, in fact, at one point got up and announced in a panel that he had a doctoral student who was going to prove that this was a forgery, which was immediately denounced as an outrage. I mean, you can't say something like that without having clear evidence. And there never was clear evidence. This was found. It was actually the inscription was found. Re reused in a wall, used to build a wall, and just as the light hit it that evening in, in uh, at Tel Dad, it reflected in such a way that it showed there was writing on it, they immediately pulled it out, and, and that's how they found it. And the other fellow uh, said, no, no, this is bait dude. This is uh, this is the house of dude. There's a god named dude that we've never heard of before. It doesn't exist, but that's what it must be, or dode, or something else. They uh, sometimes have referred to the example of Ashdod, which ends D O D, but there's no similarity. That's a completely different name. It's constructed uh it, very semitically it works and it has nothing to do with a god named dode or dude or anything else and they've never found one like it but uh that uh, individual continued to believe that until the day of his death as far as i know but what this shows you uh, with regards to this whole question is the grids that people approach these issues with and the way in which they look through grids and so you can show them evidence, all the evidence you want, and it'll get reinterpreted. You know, uh, uh, it's, it always reminds me, Jesus said this in the, in the Gospels. He said, you know, they don't believe the prophets. They won't even believe it if somebody rises from the dead. And, and that, sadly, is what we see. So you talk about bias, and you see here how something like this, how assumptions and philosophies affect the bias in such a way. Um, it's good to hear that in one sense, because you have to then 
test out your own thoughts with regards to it. But on the other hand, <clears throat> it raises a question, what would be sufficient proof for something to have actually taken place? And when, when no quarter, no, uh, no uh, concession is given to the fact that uh, the spelling House of David, which appears in the Bible spelled that way, is the only spelling known from that time uh, and oh, the, the interpretation of it as a dynasty of David is the only way to interpret it. It's very difficult to then assume that uh, that was fictitious or it can be, should be explained in another otherwise unattested manner. And I think that's part of the problem with uh, with this. And for somebody who maybe is looking at it from the outside, you can see more clearly the problems that exist. But Sometimes when you're in the midst of something, you tend to always read everything in one direction. And that's that's unfortunate uh, sometimes. <laughs> Amazing story. Okay, now uh, many believe that uh, books of Samuel was compiled in the 6th, uh, 7th century BC. Uh, what is your thought about that? Well, I think the material of Samuel is probably some of the oldest material we have with uh, very little change in terms of the spelling and writing. I think a lot of the early books of the Bible were probably updated grammatically. I don't think that their content was necessarily changed. Occasionally, there may have been notes added here or there, uh, especially if a book was in use. For example, if you did have a document such as Joshua 13 through 19, which described the borders and boundaries of the tribes, that could have been use, in use for centuries, and towns and other things could have been added to it uh, along the border and elsewhere in order to give it a, a more up-to-date uh, information without necessarily changing the border or borders or anything else. And I think with First and Second Samuel, you have... Uh, what seems to me to be a, an ancient text, uh, both a number of, of materials in the text are uh, use older terms and language, I think, with especially with regards to groups like the Philistines and also with, with other groups. You have, uh, you have a variety of different possibilities there. Uh, that I think the, the word sarin has been related to tyrannus, the Greek word for tyrant and leader, and that's the leaders of the Philistines. And the fact that there should be perhaps some sort of Greek connection or Mycenaean connection is not inconceivable if the Philistines do indeed come from the Aegean world. The idea that a number of these texts are connected with a structure that could go back very early, as I mentioned earlier, the apology for the rise of uh, David um, is also, I think, significant. And then finally, you have the evidence from the manuscripts, the fact that the, uh, the Septuagint, the Greek text, is so different, and the fact that the Hebrew uh, there are versions of the Hebrew text in the in Qumran among the Dead Sea Scrolls that are different. This suggests that very possibly we had a very early text uh, or manuscript, and it may have bridged off in certain directions that uh, are preserved in this way, because if it were late and written late, you would expect it to have a, a more of a consolidation in terms of uh, maybe the writing would be the same in the Hebrew and in the Greek and, and whatnot. The fact that it's not doesn't necessarily, uh, I mean, it doesn't prove that it's earlier, but it allows for that possibility as an explanation, put it that way. All right, I agree, totally. Uh, now, what about uh, anachronisms? Uh, Book of Samuel uh, mention uh, armor, use of uh, camels, uh, cavalry, iron picks, and axes. So, uh, how you uh, wrestle with this? 
no, I think camels are wonderful <laughs> and 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 very interesting. Um, I got into some discussion about camels with uh, some sort of friends here uh, when I raised this issue uh, because camels are are usually the uh, showpiece in uh, early Bible material for arguing that uh, this is anachronism. Often Genesis is is the first place, first port of call. Abram and others are mentioned as having camels. And so, of course, uh, there's no evidence of camels, especially if you don't accept the existence of evidence outside of when the, the term appears in the Neo or uh, later Assyrian material, and where when it appears after the 11th century BC, as it does in that material, then you simply say, well, there were no domesticated camels before that, and that's the end of the story. But uh, I would uh, invite people to look at a book by Martin Haida and uh, a friend of his uh, who worked on camels in the biblical world, I believe uh, that's the title of it in the ancient Near East, and uh, they identified the use of the of terms for camels as early as the third millennium BC in Sumerian and other texts um, describing, describing them as uh, pack animals and other things. But what I what I would emphasize is that it is largely accepted that camels were used in domesticated functions for long distances, at least by the end of the third millennium and early second millennium across Asia. And that uh, these camels would carry goods for long distances into uh, in into the Mesopotamian uh, rivers and the area there, the Tigris and Euphrates. And there is a suggestion of this, both in the use of these texts, also in the evidence found of camel bones and what have you, and also in occasional appearances in art and iconography of camels with uh, not saddles, but other objects on their backs as though they're carrying things or even a camel with gods traveling on it, this sort of thing uh, exists. Uh, what I found in my discussion was there was a misunderstanding between the word camel and the word dromedary. Dromedary is a type of camel. It, uh, it is the normal Arabian camel, as it's sometimes called, having just the one hump. And that seems to be the camel referred to in the Assyrian texts, for which there is a general view that dromedaries were not domesticated until later. But the camels that were used in Asia were certainly the Bactrian camels, as they're called. These camels traditionally have two humps and uh, therefore pretty easy to distinguish uh, from the dromedaries. And they did in fact uh, carry goods and, and uh, uh, people across long distances. They, don't, they appear in already in Genesis and they do appear throughout the early history of Israel, but never as a dominant animal until later in the in the first millennium BC. They are kind of secondary animals. The donkeys were the main uh, creatures for transport and this sort of thing throughout the second millennium BC. And that it seems to be generally accepted. Uh, certainly the donkey is the is the symbol even of royalty. You have this already attested uh, among the West Semitic, of which the Israelites become one, uh, but among the West Semitic peoples at Mari, where you have texts that talk about kings who are who ride on donkeys as a symbol of their authority, royal power, and as a symbol of bringing peace as opposed to war, such as a horse might do later. But uh, that clearly, I think, seems to be the case uh, with uh, the placement of David and uh, later Solomon, 
on donkeys and riding that that they would do that. Camels were used more for very long distances. And at the time of the second millennium, this did not take place a whole lot. It was much more common that you had the shorter distances between water sources and towns and what have you in the Fertile Crescent and down into Egypt. And the animals that would have been best for that were the donkeys, uh, the asses, and, uh, and this sort of thing. And I suspect that that's why there's so many of those, whereas there are the, is the occasional mention of ca a camel or camels, which would have been used for more special specialized needs of longer transport and wound up in, uh, in groups like this uh, now and again. So I think that this now has been much more clearly attested and established both in the iconography, that is the pictures and the images that we have in the writings and texts, especially the lexical texts, and uh, just generally in what, what is known of paleo -osteo osteology in terms of the ancient bones and finds of camels in, in, in different situations. But yeah, I would say the Bactrian camel was in use and probably would have been the one most likely even during the time of uh, of the books of Samuel. So that would be my take there. Great. We talked a little bit about iron, iron picks and things like this. And I don't think that it's impossible that iron could have been used. It certainly would have been more rare, I would think, uh, and would have been used for specialized purposes, perhaps. Uh, Although early on, I suspect there was less control of the hardness of the iron as it was made and used. And so it probably took time to develop that kind of control. And so I would not be surprised if, if bronze still was used alongside and, and uh, preferred by some. Awesome. Okay. Uh, Finkelstein uh, said that uh, Goliath uh, was like Greek warrior, not like a Philistine. Yeah. So yeah. what's your opinion? Well, of course, the Philistines and the Greeks do have a relationship, I think. Even in Amos 9, 7, we read the Philistines came from Kerr or from, uh, excuse me, Kaftor, which is usually uh, thought to be Crete and the sphere of the Greek world. And there's a number of similarities with the Philistines and uh, with the Greek world we know from Mycenaean archeology, span as well as even from some of the traditions preserved in Homer in the Iliad and the Odyssey. I, I certainly think, for example, that we find the use of the hearth in, in uh, homes and domestic dwellings move from the middle of the, the floor, such as you had more in West Semitic and Israelite, to a corner, which seems to be more characteristic of, of the Greek world where, where a hearth would be uh, placed for fire and things like this. I think that Goliath appears as a giant, and he also appears as a single warrior, and I, yeah, I, I find it uh, very possible that there is a tradition, particularly in the Mediterranean, possibly the Aegean world, where you have, for example, uh, preserved in the Iliad and the, and the fight between Hector and Achilles, and uh, Hector defeats Achilles ultimately, finding his weak spot, which in that case is, of course, his heel, and uh, it does raise questions about figures like Samson, who moves back and forth and his weakness of his uh, his hair. And and you wonder about that. But at most, one can possibly speculate, if anything, it shows an antiquity to these figures. Uh, the same way with Goliath as a single warrior fighting another single warrior. And this in some way would determine the course of the battle and the way in which uh, it went. And that is, I think, what we clearly have, uh, or what seems pretty clear to me, that we have with Goliath's relationship to the earliest Greek traditions going back into the Mycenaean uh, period of the 14th and 13th centuries BC. Yeah. Wow, you're a real encyclopedia. <laughs> uh, you're not even prepared for this. I just... Um... 
asked you so re really nice well lucky we hit on the right things <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, do we have uh, evidences that um, uh, monarchy was divided uh, in uh, Israel and Judah? Uh, can you say something yeah. about that? Yeah, well, certainly it seems more likely. In fact, there are many people who question the united monarchy, but who do not question that there was a northern kingdom of Israel and something in the south uh, developing into a kingdom at some point. And uh, so... So the division seems very clear. And of course, that that has extra biblical attestation with the Neo-Assyrian accounts uh, mentioning already under Shalmaneser III in 853 BC, where he mentions Ahab, uh, I believe Ahab, and uh, his uh, force of something like 2,000 chariots, an unusually large number, but reflective of the importance of the horse and chariotry, the cavalry, in uh, in the northern kingdom and so that's there you also have the tell dan stealer from around the same time that we mentioned earlier that mentions what seems to be very likely a northern king as well as uh, the southern uh, uh, house of david and so there is an awareness of this of these uh, two different kingdoms the question uh, often is more how did they come about the biblical evidence very clearly there in in first kings 12 chapters 12 13 14 they it suggests that there was in fact a originally a united uh, monarchy and that upon the death of solomon rehoboam attempted to enforce a more strict uh, uh corvée demand of 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 uh, work and uh, efforts to serve him personally and uh, his interests from the Northern Kingdom. And the Northern Kingdom said, no, we have done already done too much uh, with Solomon. We're not going to do this. And so they actually broke away. I would, uh, I don't think we have any archaeology, archaeological evidence that explicitly points to that. We certainly do have evidence that suggests Shechem, which seems to be the first capital in the northern kingdom uh, with this breakaway, was always a central uh, fortress and fortified uh, city. You have it, of course, with Abimelech taking over Shechem back in uh, the son of Gideon, back in Judges chapter 9, and uh, a lot of civil war and strife there. You have it a, a century or two earlier in the 14th century BC, Amarna letters where Labaya is a, a leader of Shechem and uh, seems to be one of the main resist, uh, sources of resistance to the will of the Pharaoh of Egypt. And there's a lot of discussion about the interpretation of those letters that he writes and his enemies write claiming he's a bad guy. But clearly there is a a, a power center that's quite natural there at Shechem, located strategically as it is uh, at the watershed between the two very high, among the highest mountains in Galilee, Mount Ebal to the north and Gerizim to the south. And then uh, uh, the, the gap there, Shechem itself, means shoulder uh, as a, between e the east going into the Jordan Valley and the west going down to the Mediterranean Sea. That uh, that would be a natural place for a central a center uh, to to develop, such as we see with uh, with Jeroboam the first and his decision to uh, to set something up there. Um, you can talk about the early uh, evidence the evidence for the early uh, presence of uh, Jeroboam's decision to set up. Uh, Silver, uh, gold, excuse me, calves at Bethel and uh, in the south and at Dan in the north uh, at the at the end, sort of at the at the borders of his kingdom. And that uh, that itself has a heritage both in the Bible with the gold calf that the uh, was set up at Mount Sinai by by tradition and worshipped there by the people as a kind of substitute for the invisible presence of the true God when he was in conversation with Moses. But why did they set that up? And I believe it has to do with the fact that they felt, uh, or Israel 
Israel did not trust God when he was away from them up the mountain and uh, Moses. And so they decided, having just been attacked by the Amalekites, a kind of Bedouin group of uh, pretty vicious people who would sell their their uh, captives into slavery and do all kinds of things. Uh, and though they had won that war, they felt vulnerable. And so they set this up. I believe the gold calf was at least in part, I think mainly a uh, kind of God who would be a warrior God to defend them and protect them. Hence, he brought them out of Egypt, uh, this kind of a military move. That's how they define them. And then you have the silver calf or the head, it's a little guy, <laughs> it is big, uh, who was found at Ashkelon in the, from the 18th century at the gate at Ashkelon. Again, very interestingly, it probably is a model of a larger calf that may have been worshipped there at the gate, but its head and its feet are of silver, and then bronze is, is, the, is the main structure of it. And it I think confirms this idea of the calf as a kind of younger warrior deity who is there in Ashkelon at the gate, at the entrance, so defending the city and protecting it. And that's who you look to as your protection. And that very interesting corresponds exactly with what now, so a few centuries later, to be sure, uh, some centuries later, but what we find at uh, at with Jeroboam, that he sets up these two calves at the borders to his country. And these represent sort of the defenders of the country. These are the ones who are the warrior deities, whether they're representations of Baal or some kind of syncretism with Yahweh mixed in there. Uh, I can't say, but what I can say for sure is that they stayed there a long time. Um, certainly, we have evidence uh, of the high place at Dan and the large, huge, giant altar there and the place where the, the calf might well have been positioned. And then at Bethel, we have the uh, account from uh, of Josiah in 2 Kings 25, where he uh, goes up to Bethel and destroys uh, the site there that had been used and the worship of that deity and all the priests who are involved with it. And he doesn't just destroy it, that, but he destroys the, the goddess Asherah symbol, which is also connected, it seems, with this chief god, which is part of the religion of Canaan, sad to say. But if you go back to Ugarit, you find that Asherah was the consort or sort of the wife of the chief old god their ale and 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 they were at the head of the pantheon of all the gods so there's a i'm not saying there uh, everything's exactly the same in terms of those mythological accounts but there are strands of continuity that flow through that whole period and uh, what they show is the account of jeroboam setting up the calves there really makes sense as his desire to preserve his kingdom, to prevent the Israelites from going down to Jerusalem to worship their God and give them an alternative, as it were, and to stand in that tradition of, uh, of the use of, of calves, uh, gold calves in this case, uh, uh, or sometimes silver calves. Hosea speaks of kissing silver calves as part of uh, pagan worship in the 8th century, uh, just all of this sort of thing going on. And uh, interesting, there in the middle is Jeroboam setting up these images. This is just beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, what about Finkelstein? Uh, he contended uh, that uh, existing archaeological evidence for United Monarchy in the 10th century BC uh, should be dated to the actually 9th century BC, so he pushes a little. Uh, also, he says with uh, Niall uh, Silberman that uh, United Monarchy is a creative expression of a powerful religious reform movement that are possibly based on a certain historical kernels. So what's your opinion about uh, Finkelstein and uh, this yeah. uh, pushing back? Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is a... 
this is an ongoing debate. I just reading uh, a history of ancient Israel that came out this past year and looking at it from somebody who tends to follow that point of Finkelstein, who uh, says, well, really everything needs to be pushed down. The reason why he wants to push it down a century is he wants to put it in the context of Omri and his successor Ahab. Ahab is a known historical figure outside the Bible, as I mentioned in the Assyrian account from the middle of the ninth century with the Assyrian king Shalmaneser III being involved and uh, the battle that took place at Karkar there. So he's known, whereas we don't have anybody saying, well, Solomon was here and we I fought him or something like that. So uh, it's more convenient for Finkelstein, I think, to, to suggest this. And he has, and he has argued this for a long time. And as the writer of the history book says, there are a lot of <laughs> views now between the earlier view that that sees the period uh, describing Solomon from it that time, as well as uh, a later view going as late as the ninth century for someone like Finkelstein. Uh, really, you're talking about about a hundred years there. A hundred years does is not really a a lot of time to really provide detailed. Uh, uh, chronological accounts, even with the a large amount of excavation and pottery we have. So I always want to be careful about those sorts of conclusions. I know, for example, they were there would be a lot of debate. I mentioned the gates at Hatsor, Megiddo, and Gezer. And so Finkelstein excavated at Megiddo, so perhaps not surprisingly, he would date those gates later. Whereas uh, William Deaver, who excavated at Gezer, retains the view that the, that that gate is primarily Solomonic and doesn't see the issue uh, even with these other gates. So I'm not an expert in pottery chronology by any means, but I do think that what we have here is disagreements that come about in part because of interest in trying to connect certain events with certain times and people. And, and that's what I'm seeing. I would refer back to some of the arguments I made earlier for the presence of uh, temple structures, of architecture, of textual evidence, of uh, surrounding materials, and, uh, and like the gates I mentioned, uh, and of, of the copper production out of the uh, uh, Fainan Valley. All of this uh, points in my mind fits well within a 10th century BC era. Um, so I don't I don't see that as a problem. I know there's the feeling that Jerusalem is just simply too small to be at the center of an empire, but it's hard to to know how meant how much of the walls that were used in the middle bra uh, 500 years earlier, or 700 years earlier continued. We know that in some cases they did. And so we don't really know a lot of detail about uh, all of the walls from the time of Solomon. We, But we do know that there were walls there and defenses there that did remain. And so it is very possible that they could continue to have been used and the, and the site itself would have been larger to sustain this kind of... Uh, the role of, of Solomon, something not unlike what's described in the Bible. So those are some thoughts. Nice. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, some would say, um, okay, uh, David maybe existed, but he was not certainly king. He was just a chief. Uh, how do we know uh, based on uh, historical facts and uh, uh, how we know that yeah. he was not just a chief? <laughs> yeah. It's it is a it is an interesting point, and I again would refer to to some extent to the architecture, possibly the large buildings and structure that we do find that uh, Elat Mazar dated to the 10th century and back to the time of David. We also have the uh, witness, of course, of the scriptures themselves, which suggests something more than a local chieftain, and and. Uh, what I've already referred to, I, I think um, 
for one thing, I think there there is a, I really have to be careful about using these different descriptors because they are anthropological descriptors and they come from other societies and cultures and get superimposed in some ways on the biblical account. That is, David could have been a chieftain and a king. He could have ruled over the region. He also could have ruled over more. And we don't know, for example, the Bible talks about uh, winning and, and defeating the Arameans. It's, it's not at all impossible. People fought battles at that time, and somebody had to win and somebody had to lose. And the Bible records the role of David as, as being a victor. But when he did, for example, uh, conquer uh, 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 some of the Aramean states, it's not clear that he remained in those states. In some cases, he may have pulled back because of his own strategic interests, but continued to exert economic and other influence, as the Bible suggests, as far up as the Euphrates. And certainly that was seems to have been true later on in the book of Second Kings. We have a number of uh, kings of Israel, of the northern kingdom, uh, including some who seem to have gone as far as the Euphrates in terms of exerting influence when there were times of other of weakness among the other states. So I don't think it's at all impossible that that sort of impact and influence would have continued. Uh, we just don't have uh, textual evidence outside the Bible. What we have in the Bible is consistent uh, with a picture of someone who is more than just a chieftain of Jerusalem and the area around it. It's, uh, it is suggestive, certainly, of somebody who had a, a much wider control of the area. It's, I think, a bit clearer in Solomon's time because you have the trappings of imperial rule that he gradually takes on. It's less clear outside the Bible in the time of David because he's less interested in that, and he's maintaining uh, the kingdom that he has and expanding it against enemies round about. Sometimes I think we forget that the position of Israel is really, you know, uh, Anson Rainey and Stephen Notley wrote a book, a historical geography book called The Sacred Bridge. And it really is a bridge between Africa, Asia, and even up through Turkey into Europe. And so and, and then the Mediterranean as well. But but the point is, you're, these, these kings were surrounded by enemies. And they found themselves always uh, on the need to be on the defensive and to fight. And so uh, I think the fact that there is that tradition that certainly extra biblically goes back to the Tel Dan inscription... And possibly the house of David is also mentioned in the Mesha inscription. Oh, that was that was broken up, and we only have a little bit of a freeze at the bottom suggesting that. Uh, again, from that period, it does suggest that in that region, you don't name a dynasty like House of after an unknown figure. It's usually named after the the founder of that dynasty who is a ruler, who is a king, not someone who is just uh, the father of the first ruler and just uh, starting and, and fighting here and there. Uh, certainly that's, uh, that's true of Omri too, and his dynasty of whom Ahab was the best known, but, but he too began with establishing a, a kingdom. But I think David's was much bigger, and that's why it's remembered in these texts more than a hundred years after after he ruled. It's not the house of Solomon, it's the house of David. So it, it suggests that there is a, a significance to his rule. Yeah. Wow, excellent answer. Uh, thank you. Uh, but uh, someone would say, uh, why don't we find uh, many more inscriptions, uh, maybe a hundred uh, inscriptions about David and Solomon. Uh, why well, we find just few? Yeah, no, that's a good question, and uh, I would, I would say there are a couple of reasons for that, which I think are important to always keep in mind. One is that unlike the inscriptions, say, of Assyria and Babylonia, 
which were inscribed by styluses into clay. And then sometimes that clay was even baked. That could be preserved forever. And that that just remains that. Uh, OK, so we have a hundred more than a hundred thousand, uh, hundreds of thousands of tablets and lots of inscriptional data there. Um, and then in Egypt, we have papyrus and writing there. They tended to draw like you like they did in Israel, but you drew hieroglyphs and things like that. But there you have the papyrus, which in a very dry land like that will be preserved. But papyrus is an organic substance. And in Israel, they didn't use clay tablets to write their records. The, the kings of uh, Israel didn't use that. They used an alphabetic script, which itself was a becoming, it was a kind of revolution because it meant many more people could read. They could read the Bible, they could read whatever was written, but it, it gave them access. But in order to write on that, you don't you you don't use a clay tablet. You use either papyrus from the papyrus plant, or you use a uh, vellum, which is animal skin, goat skins, or something like this, which are refined and then drawn on. Well, these are organic materials, and organic materials in a moister climate, even like Jerusalem, and certainly like in the northern kingdom as well, they tend to disintegrate. We have no papyrus. We have no vellum uh, inscriptional material anywhere in Israel, in Philistia, in Moab, in Edom, in Ammon, in uh, uh, the Aramean uh, uh, nations to the north. It just doesn't exist. Um, the only place we have it is in the Dead Sea. And most of that comes from the second and first century B.C., of course, as the Dead Sea Scrolls. But very interestingly, there was a uh, what's called a, 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 a papyrus text uh, or a vellum text, uh, uh, an organic text on which was written, uh, had been written an early administrative document with some names and numbers that, that actually came from the 7th or 8th century BC uh, and was written in Israel. But somehow it got to the Dead Sea and somebody scraped that off and then rewrote on top of it what they wanted to write because this was rare material. Paper wasn't something you could go to a store and buy for a few dollars. It was very rare and difficult to find and it disintegrated. So they used it. Uh, so that's the only piece. And that's only because it found its way off uh, over to the Dead Sea. Otherwise, the only written records that exist anywhere in this region are occasional pieces of writing on potsherds or pieces of pottery. Uh, once in a while, there is there there was, for example, the Mesha of Moabite stela, which is inscribed, written on it, and uh, you can read that, but that's rare. Uh, that, however, is made of clay and, and stone, and so it preserves. You have the Tel Dan stela, uh, a piece of that, that had been two pieces actually had been preserved in the wall there at Dan. And again, that's inscribed, but those are, are uh, national monuments sort of that would have been set up by the king for the purpose of reading. So those are already rare. You don't have many of those being made. There's one that was found in Samaria, but there's only one letter <laughs> preserved. It's a very tiny fragment. So these things do did exist. And, and, and in Philistia uh, at, uh, at Ekron, there's an inscription as well like that. And they're wonderful to find, but they're rare. And there aren't very many of them. And then you look at, uh, at a, a, a place where, where would the inscriptions, where would the writings have been preserved? Well, the, the most natural place would have been in Jerusalem, either in the temple or in the palace or in archival buildings next door to them. Well, Jerusalem is one of the most fought over, destroyed, rebuilt, destroyed places in the history of, of humanity. Uh, so it'd be very hard to have anything preserved from them. It's amazing that we do. We have a whole archive 
of uh, dozens and dozens of uh, of what were originally papyri from a, from just before the destruction of the temple in five uh, and the city in five eighty six B.C. The Baba, by the Babylonians, and then clay seals. Well, the clay seals have writing on them of the person who the document was for or about. But the actual document, the papyrus, has long ago been destroyed, and we only have those clay seals with that writing on them. Now, more recently, uh, in the excavations at the Salome uh, pool uh, in the south of, of the city of David, they found about, I think, 100, 150 seals. Again, just the, not the seals, it's, it's the impression of the seal, the seal is gone, but the impression on the wax, which is called, the technical term is bulla, B-U-L-L-A is one of them, and bulla is, is a many. They found over 100 of these from uh, in a context that dates from the 9th century BC, which is amazing. It shows, again, you just have the bulla, you don't have the papyrus document, but for every one of those that was found, it was part of a small archive that contained that many papyrus letters, documents, whatever else, that would have been closed and sealed with this uh, wax uh, impression. So we have the impression. We don't have writing from that time. It's just designs and things on them. But we clearly have, even going back to as early as the 9th century BC, evidence of an archive in Jerusalem. So there was writing. And I already mentioned a couple dozen uh, uh, fragments and texts from around Israel from the 10th century. So there was writing, but uh, unfortunately, the accidents of preservation don't allow it to have, uh, have been preserved and left for us uh, in terms of the papyrus and the vellum, which would be really interesting. Can you imagine having a scroll from that time or a text, but we don't have, you don't have it in Israel, you don't have it in uh, the Judah, you don't have it in Phoenicia, Aram, Damascus, as I said, Moab, Ammon, Edom, uh, anywhere around there, Philistia, uh, that, that's the reason. I mean, you could ask the same thing of these other societies and cultures as well, and you get the same answer. Amazing. <laughs> My head will explode, I think. <laughs> this is uh, great. Uh, thank you. Uh, okay, last question. Just about uh, authorship of the uh, Book of Kings. Um, do you believe that um, traditional uh, authorship, uh, I think it's uh, Jeremiah, is it uh, possible or maybe someone else? Also for uh, Samuel, uh, did Samuel wrote uh, he, uh, he and uh, God, Nathan, I believe. What's your thought? All right. Yeah. Um, the the short answer to these is I don't know because the and and the Bible doesn't make any claim specifically about this. It's very possible that a figure like Samuel could have written a lot of that material. It's clear he was involved in a lot of it, and so before he died. And uh, he may have kept records. It's also possible that in the court of David and in the court of Solomon, that they actually, uh, scribes there put together, we clearly have names actually and mention of scribes that existed. And uh, the scribes or the recorders could have put together that document and preserved it as in part a, a, an official document. The amazing thing about it, of course, has long been noted, is that that the book of Samuel, in terms of David, who's probably the chief figure, certainly the most powerful figure, is very honest about David. It talks about all of his foibles and his sins, his sin with Bathsheba, his uh, killing of Uriah. So uh, he never hid any of this, which you would expect a king who had interest in only perpetuating his glory, too. So it's possible that somebody like Samuel was involved or Nathan the prophet or other other figures uh, and that they wrote it. And uh, it's possible that others were also involved. We just don't know. I wish we did. Of course, some of that, like uh, I mentioned, 1 Kings 4, the administrative data 
Uh, you also get that at the end of Second Samuel, some of David's mighty men and things like this. Those could originally have been administrative lists that were taken and incorporated into the larger document that comes to be known as the books of Samuel and then Kings. Uh, I, I would see the same thing for the books of Kings, I think, in, in uh, large. In fact, uh, the book of Kings and uh, to a lesser extent, Samuel, do actually mention uh, sources that the this material comes from they talk about the chronicles of the kings of israel the chronicles of the kings of judah and it says are not the rest of his deeds when they come to the end of a king and the so so and he died are not the rest of his deeds recorded in the book of the chronicles of the kings of of judah and whatever uh and i think that there were certainly such books that such collections of formal analytic accounts we know that the societies around them, Assyria, Babylonia, Hittites, uh, Egypt, they preserve various books like this as well. And so I suspect that that's what went on. I also think that uh, certainly in these books and as we move forward in Kings, you get the sense that there is a very, very clear theological message. This isn't primarily a history book. There's a lot of material that's skipped over. It deals much more with the work of God among his people. And that would suggest perhaps the priests were involved in writing and, and they certainly would have been scribal. They were trained to teach the people and to and to read the scriptures and to uh, explain them. And so that it could well be that there were priestly figures involved. It's not impossible. A prophet like Jeremiah. Jeremiah is one of the more uh detailed prophets when it comes to recording that he wrote that his words on a scroll and of course the king cut them up jehoiakim and then he went back and he wrote another scroll so there there there's clear and he had a a, a secretary baruch who helped him so it's clear that there there was a writing practice and tradition certainly going on in in Jerusalem and I believe beyond Jerusalem, and so I think these these records uh, could have been written by a variety of different figures, uh, probably in and around uh, the 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 temple or among prophetic circles who preserved them and then passed them on. My impression is that ultimately all of the books of the Old Testament that were written before the exile would have been collected by the priests in the temple. And there would have been exemplars there and maybe other people copied and made copies that they took other places to read and teach. But that's where the, the, the models were kept, the, the, the pristine, uh, as pristine as they could get. And when they went into exile, they took those with them. And then when they came back, <laughs> excuse me, they brought back those scrolls and continued to keep them because the temple would have been the safest place. It was the sort of the bank. It was where you kept your your most precious goods so that nobody would come in and change the wording or anything else. So anyway, some thoughts. Yeah, great. We talked about uh, Solomon. Uh, do we have his books? Uh, is he author of... Uh... Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and uh, Song of Songs. What's your thought? And that's the yeah. last of question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that uh, certainly the Proverbs, uh, at least the first part of the Proverbs, uh, the book of Proverbs, are, are those that can be traced back to Solomon. I don't know how. Uh, there may have been a few added here and there. Some Solomon himself may have heard and collected. I mean, he may not have originated all of them. Proverbs 25, 1 then talks about these are the rest of the Proverbs that the men of Hezekiah collected. So it suggests that there were other at least editors and individuals involved in putting together that book. Uh, but the wisdom tradition in Israel all traces back to Solomon. And so in some way or another, it's connected. Now, did Solomon write Ecclesiastes? Uh, I don't know. I think my view is that the sentiments of Ecclesiastes could well have been expressed by a figure like Solomon at a certain point in his life, a more skeptical point, if you will, but that the book as we have it was updated linguistically. 
Uh, this is not a, this is probably 6th century, 5th century BC, even that late, I would say. Uh, I don't think uh, it's earlier, but that doesn't mean that the, some of the material in it, the text in it and things couldn't go back earlier. We have examples of this kind of skepticism. You don't have to wait until Greek philosophy comes along to find skeptics. You already have them. There's an ancient West Semitic text called the Wisdom of Shupi Ameli, which is a very, it's a very interesting text. It's between a kind of discussion or text between a father and a son. And the father writes the traditional wisdom, very much similar to Proverbs, because after all, a lot of Proverbs is also found in other ancient Near Eastern wisdom sources as well. It's not unique, although the idea of the fear of the Lord at the beginning of wisdom and some of the covenantal connections that are in are unique and are special to the Bible. But anyway, uh, the father writes that, and then the son is very rebellious in a different tone and writes much more like the book of Ecclesiastes. Oh, everything, you know, it's not worth it. And you grab for what you can and you're going to die. And so these two come together, but they actually, there are texts of these among the Hittites, among the uh, Adugarit, Amar. This is 13th century BC. This is long, it was before Solomon. So the idea that this, these kinds of sentiments could not have been alive and around, certainly during the time of Solomon and later, is not at all impossible. I certainly think we have that. And we have it in the West Semitic world, not in Babylon or Egypt or some other place. It's right there nearby. So, yeah. And then uh, I think a book like uh, The Song of Songs, which is kind of more love poetry than wisdom uh, in its own way, I think that too is uh, uh, maybe traces back to, it's certainly, the setting is more that of the monarchy, but the language is updated, it's later, the, the grammar and, and language is, is later. So I would I see something similar. The book of Job is unique, it's very different. And I certainly think the poetry and whatnot of Job, it suggests, I believe Job may not even have been an Israelite. It says he was the leader, the head of all the, the wisest man of all the men of the East. So I think he probably comes from East of Israel and was a God-fearing believer, but not an Orthodox law by, you know, Torah abiding observant Israelite. Uh, this is why I think he can offer sacrifices for his sons and act in this way, because in Israel, you couldn't do that. You need the priest to come in and do it. And so uh, I suspect that this is a figure who is a kind of unique figure whose traditions and words, this is part of the reason why it's difficult to read dialectically. I think it's a little bit different from the Jerusalem dialect, and it comes to us via that way. But I think it all reflects the general wisdom theology of Israel going back to Solomon. And uh, so I see that as a common principle behind it, though I don't necessarily think that he penned the words that we have as they are now. I also think, by the way, while I'm on this, uh, that uh, Ecclesiastes is not just simply a negative book with a little bit of fear of God slapped on the end of it. I think Ecclesiastes is a pre-evangelist, ev excuse me, a pre-evangelism tract. I think it's designed to say uh, to the person who is skeptic, who said, I've tried, I've looked for God, I've looked for meaning, and I can't find it. And what this person says, who uh, sort of claims to be a king and like Solomon, son of David, he says, I have, I have walked this road. And I have, you know, I have discerned the same things. Here, I will walk with you as you read Ecclesiastes. And you will see, yeah, I agree. Yeah, the, the, the world itself is incapable of generating its own meaning, and it will be meaningless if you try to find it within the world itself. And even trying to find God in that context is meaningless. And so it says at the end, but there is a, there is a hope, there is a direction that I have found, and that is the revelation of God. Fear God and keep his Torah. That is the end of the matter. And it just points you in that direction. And then you've got to go your own and do your own work beyond that. But I think that's what it's designed for. It's designed for the skeptic 
who has fa who has had trouble understanding this world and how it's put together and and the writer says yeah so have i and this is how i've walked and here is is so i will walk with you and and here is what i found as the direction at the end Great message. Thank you, Dr. Hess. So uh, at conclusion, uh, I wrote uh, in uh, Wikipedia that uh, because of the disagreements uh, between uh, minimalists and maximalist uh, relations um, have been characterized by inflamed rhetoric and uh, <laughs> frequent personal attacks. So uh, can you say at conclusion how we should interact with minimalists and how we should speak with them and uh, what's the point of this? <laughs> yeah. No, I think any challenge like this, I mean, that's part of, you know, the Paul says, be ready to give an answer for the hope that is within you. And I think this is all part of that. And I certainly think that to begin to chip away and and uh, and allow uh, skeptical attacks without any answer is, I think, to yield the field. And I think it, it creates doubt and it creates uh, it doesn't it doesn't sow the seeds of faith, it sows the seeds of skepticism. And I don't want that. So I don't claim to have all the answers. I think I think the proper attitude has to be one of humility and one of dealing with the issues rather than dealing with the people. Um, this is always an issue. I've had my share of interaction with people who disagree with me and sometimes it gets very sort of personal attacks and whatnot. And I have always wanted to, I don't know if I succeeded, but I've always wanted to avoid that. I'm much more interested in dealing with the ideas and what the uh, what is the evidence? Let's look at the evidence. Here's what you say as I understand it. Here's what I say. This is how my I respond. And I want it that way. So oftentimes when I write like a response or a letter. And if you look on my website, you'll see a number of interaction that I've done over the years uh, are, are there under some of the questions that are asked. But um, what I do is I'll write something out, I'll read over it a couple of times, I'll maybe leave it for a day or two and come back and reread it when I'm not quite as hot and I, <laughs> uh, as I might be. And and that then enables me to really just mercilessly edit out all the ad hominem attacks because that's not what I want. That doesn't support uh, the argument. It it may may me it may make me feel better for a bit, but it doesn't support the argument in the end. And so I'd rather do, I'd rather do that. Certainly, I've made mistakes or errors and claims here and there, and I'd want to admit that. But at the same time, I do think there are answers. I don't think that some of the skeptical constructions and uh, things are correct. And I do think they can be met with uh, responses. And that's what I want to do. I want to respond to the issues, not to the people. Dr. Rick, thank you very much for your time. Uh, I really enjoyed and hope that people will uh, learn much from this lecture. Uh, dear listeners, uh, please follow oldtestamentquestions.com and uh, Dr. Rick and his work, uh, his books, and may God bless you all. Thank you.